Yeah. All right. Um, last time we were here, uh, we just opened up First John and we're, we're starting to look at it. And uh, I have I have handouts. I'm not going to go over this again, but I had the handout on just the comparison of the beginning of the book of First John and John's Gospel. We talked about how First John itself doesn't have John's name in it. It's technically anonymous, but it's it's always been taken together with second and third John, and they do say from John, so we know that those were by John. But then it it was making the point that even if you didn't know that first John was written by John, there's there's a great overlap and similarity of words and themes in how the Gospel of John began and how first John begins. There's also some overlap with Revelation. Um, and again, I said, there, there are scholars that will debate this and scholars debate things because that's how they justify their career sometimes. <laughs> there are scholars that debate whether the Gospel of John, these letters and Revelation were by different people, um, the, the most straightforward thing, when you, just when you read them, is they have so much similarity in how, their style and language that, that, and, and John, and there's only one John that, that loomed large enough to be connected with all of these, that is the disciple John. And um, so that's, that's how I teach and how I introduce them. There is still, and this is a point of debate, the order in which all of those were written. So was the gospel written first and then the epistles and then revelation? There is no, this is for sure the answer. It's, it's my, the way that I teach and the way that I understand is that revelation was probably written first. That was written when he was still under perse uh, persecution. He was on the island of Patmos. And then he was released when the emperor that sentenced him died and a new emperor came this this very often happened when one emperor dies the new the new one comes and your enemies are not my enemies it's kind of how they make good and increase their standing and so they they release political prisoners and and whatnot and so john was released and he went back to ephesus or that area around ephesus and then these letters are kind of connected with that and I think these letters came next, and then the gospel came. He wrote that kind of as, as his final thing. But, and I'm going to talk about this, even though he wrote the gospel last, the, the gospel was always a part of him. What, what did John do after Pentecost? He did the same thing that all of the other apostles did. They went around and told people about Jesus. And... The way that they told people about Jesus was not that they retired to their study and they wrote down the Gospels. The way that they told people about Jesus was literally telling people about Jesus. They went and they spoke and they, they told people. Um, and so that was a part of their culture. And so after doing that, um, if, if you've ever ha had some sort of thing, maybe for, for work or uh, volunteering where you've had to give a presentation and you have to give that same presentation in, in multiple places, you know that that the story sticks with you. The, the gospel kind of wrote, wrote itself because he had spent his whole life telling people about Jesus. And so First John, you know, it's, it's kind of like he starts where he always starts. He starts at the beginning and that's how the gospel began. That's how this begins. But in 1 John, his goal was not to tell people about Jesus. These people already knew about Jesus. They knew his story. There's some problem that he's addressing. And so we'll get into what is the problem that he's addressing and what's going on. So I handed that out. I also handed out this uh, little poster and gave you a YouTube link. Uh, this is from a, a, a group called Bible Project, and they do explainer videos of the Bible. They do explainer videos over every single book of the Bible, and then they also do themes. 
um, and I said they're they're really good. And if you go, if you look for a video from Bible Project on the letters of John, they will have like a six to eight minute video where like they animate and go through this. And all it does is goes through the book of First John and sort of gives you an overview and outline of it. So um, I gave you those resources last time. And then the last thing I did was we had um, some time off. So I said, John's gospel, chapter 14 through 17, is a section of his gospel where Jesus is sort of giving his, his final words to his disciples. And that section of scripture is deeply influential on 1 John. So I said, you know, if you have time, read, read over John 14 through 17. So now it's the time where I make you sweat. <laughs> did, did anybody actually do that, read through John 14 through 17? Just did. You just did it. <laughs> right now. Um, I, 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 if, if you don't have time, I, I would encourage you again. We're not, we're not going to do it now, but it's, it's because... Shifting from First John to shifting from Paul's letter to the Ephesians to First John, it's just it's a different style and it's a different way of writing. And one thing that's very common to us, an observation about it, is we would say it's it's repetitive. Um, you, you don't. I, we'll, I'll take care of those at the end of class. Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna look at them right now. Um, it's repetitive. But if you read John 14 through 17, you'll find the same thing is true, that he, he repeats things over and over. And it's, it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's kind of instead of like linear and... Somebody's phone's going off. Those are all random. Yep. Instead of linear, it's kind of a, a circular logic, and what happens is that they kind of have a theme, and it's like you're walking on a staircase, and you, you go around and around that, that central point, that theme, but each time you kind of say something a little bit different or make a different emphasis. So you, you find in reading First John, it's, it's just different, and it, it might sound like it's repetitive, but it's part of what's going on. They didn't get a hold of Bob, so now they're calling Dr. you. Gabriel. You guys are the busiest, the busiest people in the world. Okay, so that's, that's all the introductory stuff. Now I'm going to give you the handout that we are actually going to talk about. Again, if you didn't have the handouts from last time, I'll, I'll make sure that you get them. And I will also remind you that on our church's website, we have, I post all of these handouts, and so you can, you can download them there as well. Okay, so the handout that is going around is just 1 John verses 1 through 4, and you can open to it in your Bible as well, that's no problem. What's on here is those words from the ESV translation, and then I, I have footnotes, I have some notes, and then I, I make the text look a little bit funny, um, which is to try to help you break down some of the, the thoughts and see the, the logic and what's going on. So 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we read through these last time just to see the similarity between John's gospel and this. Now, now we're actually going to look at it for the sake of content. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. And I'm going to pause there. So it doesn't start from John to so-and-so. This is, it's, it's anonymous. It doesn't actually sound like an epistle, a letter, but... But it is. Uh, he is addressing a, a group of people, and you'll hear we, 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 and you, you, and sometimes I and you. Um, he's, he's addressing people. And the way that it starts, it doesn't start from John to so-and-so, 
but he reveals who he is by what he says. So who is this that's talking right now? He speaks as a, as a we. It's a we who have heard, who have seen with our eyes, and have looked upon and touched with our hands. And you kind of, it, it'll take him a while. What is he talking about? Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, okay? So this is from somebody who's heard him, who's seen him, who's touched him with his hands. At this point in time, and I said the date we're looking at, it's probably in the 80s AD. So Jesus is born around 1 AD, give or take a few years. He dies around 30 AD, give or take a few years. This is now some 50 years past that, okay? So you think about people, and people in Jesus' day, on average, had a much lower lifespan, okay? And that's true because, like, infant mortality, many, many more children would not have made it out of their childhood. And then add on to that, there's no real hospitals and, 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 and whatnot. But there are people that lived into long life. There are, there are accounts of people who lived to be 90, 100. It's unusual, but, but it did happen in, in that day. And John seems to have been one of those people that lived for quite a while. Now, John, you, you kind of have to piece this together, but John, when Jesus called him as a disciple, seems to have been rather young. So he was not uh, an, a like 20 year old. He wasn't a peer of Jesus. He would have been younger than Jesus was. So how, how do we know that? Well, one, based on how long, how long he's living right now. If he were born, you know, in the same age as Jesus, at this time, he would be about 90 years old. And while he did live long, he lived even longer than the, the 80s and 90s. We don't know exactly when he died, but um, about 100 AD is, is when it seems to be. So if he was born the same time of Jesus, that would have been stupendously a really long life. But if he's about 20 years younger than Jesus, um, then right now he's in his 60s or 70s, which again is, is old, but not, not yet super old. Why, why do I think that he's younger than Jesus? So one is because of how long he lives. But when Jesus calls him, he's a, he's a fisherman. He is, along, along with Peter, Peter was a fisherman with his brother Andrew, and James and John were working in their father's business and other servants, this is what we hear in the call of, of Peter and, and James and John, that they worked in their father's business. And it's, it's quite likely that if they would have been the same age of Jesus, they should have like had their own business. They wouldn't have been working under their father anymore. They would have been their own man, so to speak. Um, they could still work, you know, parallel, but um, that, that, that's, that's one small bit. And then um, Jesus gives, at the cross, Jesus gives Mary to be John, for, to take care of um, Mary. And uh, again, there, there seems to have been a close relationship with James and John and, and Mary's family. There's, there's some question of whether this this we know that John the baptizer was a relative of of Jesus because Mary and Elizabeth are said to be cousins or relatives remember when Mary's pregnant she goes to see Elizabeth and why did she see Elizabeth because she was a, a relative um so so anyways piecing all of that together we know that John was younger lives a long time my point is that now it's like 85 AD and you get a letter like this. We've heard Jesus. We've seen him with our eyes. We've touched him with our hands. There are fewer and fewer and fewer people that could have actually said that. Peter and Paul were martyred around 65, 66 AD. So about 20 years before this. 
And then there are other accounts of some of the other apostles and how they were martyred. Um, but there is no account of John being martyred. John, as far as we know, died of, of old age, even though he was persecuted. He didn't die because of his persecution. So when somebody writes in this way, it's, it basically says, I was a disciple of Jesus. I, I was an apostle. I was somebody who, who interacted with him, who saw him. I was an eyewitness. And the point is, at this late of a date, there were not very many eyewitnesses left. There, there weren't a lot of people. This is now 50 years, 60 years after Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven. So he doesn't have to say, hi, I'm John. This is a better way of saying it. And it's actually going to be more thematic. We're going to start to see what is the problem. The problem is there are other people that are telling other stories about Jesus. And John's going to say, those aren't true. Do, do you know how I know it's not true? Because I was there. I heard him. I saw him. I, I know what you guys need is, is an eyewitness, somebody who was there. I'm that eyewitness. And so this is why you need to trust me. This is why you need to believe me. Those people who are saying these things where did they come from? What's their pedigree? What's their authority? They, they don't have to have it. And he doesn't just say, I'm an apostle. He, the, the, these are the credentials of an apostle, though, that, that he's an eyewitness. So he's beginning that way. And I'm saying that's important, not just because it identifies him. It's going to start to address the issue that he's writing about. And Paul dealt with this too, right? Other people are coming in after him and they're teaching another gospel. And Paul would say, there is no other gospel. And how did Paul know? Because he too had an encounter with Jesus on Damascus Road. And then after that, he went and talked to Peter. He went to talk to the apostles who were there during Jesus' ministry to you know, make sure this is the truth. And then from there, he went and, and proclaimed that. So even Paul has his own validation and authority. What this also reminds you of, though, is, again, same guy writing this. At the end of the Gospel of John, he tells the story of Doubting Thomas. Remember, all the other disciples on Easter evening, they see and feel and, you know, he really is risen from the dead and how happy they were. Thomas wasn't there. And then the next week, Jesus comes back, and this time Thomas is there, and he says to him, touch. You know, feel, feel for yourself, Thomas. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And then in the Gospel of John, this is John 20, he says, this is what I wrote about, but blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. John knows that this was Thomas, this was the resurrection, that, that first Easter. There are going to be people that will not have this opportunity. That's us. That's us. That's, that's the people that he's writing to as well. And so what, what did they have? They had those eyewitnesses. And you'd think, well, I, I need something better than that. But the truth of the matter is, for you to establish anything, if you weren't there... What's, what's the best way that you have to establish the truth of, the, of some matter? Believe somebody that was there. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, that is the only thing that any of us have. And whether it's Jesus or, or any other thing, somebody tells you about something that happened in the neighborhood, and you're like, hmm, that sounds like hearsay. That sounds like gossip. Were, were you there? Did you see it? Oh, no, I didn't. Well, then how do you know this? How did you, where did you hear it from? And you kind of trace it back and nobody was there. Nobody knew. So you're like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm not going to put a lot of credence in that. But, oh, I was there. I saw it happen. Then, then all of a sudden it becomes more believable. And that's what the gospel is based on. It's based on eyewitnesses, which, again, you're like, but I want to be the eyewitnesses. We, we are not granted that, but we have the eyewitness testimony. That's what the Gospels consist of. That's what this epistle is talking about. Okay, so the first verse is 
just verifying what it is that he's going to be talking about is something that he knows experientially. He was there. He experienced it. He knew Jesus. He saw him. He touched him, risen from the dead. Uh, He says, concerning the word of life. And so he doesn't say specifically Jesus here. Um, He he goes on and it's, it's about Jesus, but he talks about Jesus as the word of life. As we mentioned in John's gospel, that's the way he introduces Jesus to, uh, as the word in the beginning was the word. And um, this, this I think is important because the way that people were introduced to Jesus now in this generation is through the word, through, through the gospel message being proclaimed to you. So, yes, it is Jesus that he's talking about, but how are they first at encountering Jesus? As, as words, as the words that are proclaimed to the people. But Jesus told the disciples, these are my words. I'm giving you my words and my authority to go proclaim this good news. And if you read John 14 through 17, you know that, again, this is part of the theme. Jesus says, in a little while, I'm going to go, and I'm not going to be with you anymore. And the disciples are like, well, what are we going to do? He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the the comforter, the paraclete, and the Holy Spirit is going to tell you my words. He's going to bring you back to my words and open them to you. So the apostles' job wasn't to invent new words of Jesus. It was to go back to the words that they heard and to tell people those words. And those words were life. Again, John in his gospel has a story about this in John 6. Um, Jesus has this really long sermon It's about the bread of life. So it happens after he feeds the 5,000. And then what happens in John's gospel after he feeds the 5,000? He kind of goes away. But the people, they're like, where'd Jesus go? And, And they try to follow him. So he let his disciples go, and they went in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and they went to the next place. And Jesus said, don't worry, I'll I'll catch up to you. And then he walks on water and, you know, catches catches up to them and gets there first. Well, the people knew there's only one way for Jesus to leave. He must have left on boat. And so where did those boats go? And they they follow him. And so Jesus gives this sermon, we call it the bread of life, because he talks about he is the bread of life. And he, he a little bit is criticizing the people because he's like, why did you follow me? Is it because I fed you? And you're just looking for, you know, more food, more handouts. This is a pretty great thing. Um, and, and then he talks about how the, the, the faith that, it, that is required, um, that, that they are going to be called to eat his flesh. And that was like, what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? And so some of the people are like, he's too weird for me. And they left. And so Jesus then tells his disciples these guys are leaving because this is too hard. Are, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Do you know how it goes after that? Have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. So his disciples recognize that his word isn't just, it's not just a story. It's not just a teaching. He's the son of God. And in the beginning, God created everything by his word. And Jesus, by his word, forgave sins. By his word, he healed people. By his word, he promises us eternal life. And so what John is writing about is about Jesus, but it's about a word. It's about his words. It's about the gospel message. And that message is everything to us. It's life. Not just this kind of life. It's that everlasting life. It's eternal life. And he talks about it as the life that was made manifest. Here he's, he's talking about the life of, of the whole world that became a human, the incarnation, um, like you and me, except not like you and me because he's the son of God. He's without sin. And again, he, 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 he's emphasizing this. 
So he's talking about Jesus, the life that was made manifest. He's talking about Jesus, the incarnation, when he was walking here on earth. And what does he say? We have seen it. And we testify. Again, eyewitnesses. We're telling you what it is that we saw. We're testifying about it. And we're proclaiming to you the eternal life. So what Jesus came to do, he accomplished. And that's why we speak. That's what we're telling you about. Um, but th this is this is life in, in a whole new kind of way. This is eternal life. And he talks about how it was with the Father, that Jesus was with the Father, that Jesus has always existed, again, from the beginning. He's, he's always been there, but he came here in a new and different way when he became flesh, and, and we saw him. So... Um, he, start, he repeats himself. So you notice how verse 2, the life was made manifest, and then it says, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the Father, and was made manifest to us. You see how he kind of, he said it and now he repeats it? This is part of that circularity where you might say something and then you say something like a sandwich and then you get back to and you repeat yourself. That's, that's part of this thought. It's, it's that style of communication, which to us, um, if, if you ever taught to write a, a five paragraph essay or to do a speech, like you're, you're taught that style, right? That at the beginning, you, you kind of get people's attention, you say what it is that you're gonna say, and then you say it, and then you repeat what it is that you said, and then you leave them with kind of that last nugget. Like that's, that's a circularity, right? because people are hearing it. You introduce the idea, and then you f flesh out the idea, and then you rehash it, and we're more likely to retain it. They're, they're building that. Well, this letter was a, a letter, but most people are gonna hear it with their ears, not read it with their eyes, and so that circularity is, is a way of thought. Um, but it, 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 it emphasizes this something. So what was emphasized? The life was made manifest and was, manifest, was, manif was made manifest to us. Some things that he emphasizes are, again, that he saw it. He's a messenger of it. He's testifying and proclaiming it. And it's not just regular life. It's eternal life. So all of those things important are important, which are in, the, in that sandwich. Um, but look, he does it again. So the next verse, that which we have seen and heard. Wait a second, didn't he say that in verse one, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes? So he's, he's circling back again. So he's closing a loop. He's closing that thought. The first thought is verse one through the beginning of verse three, which is, who am I? I'm an eyewitness. An eyewitness of what? To what? To the word of life. Again, it, it's still kind of coded. We know he's talking about Jesus, but he doesn't say Jesus here, but that's who he's talking about. And he's emphasizing his being there, his seeing it. 3b, that's the second part of, of verse 3, we proclaim also to you. So if you're a grammar nerd, Everything that's happened up until this point has been a subordinate clause. It's not a main sentence. The main sentence is, we proclaim also to you. What is it that we proclaim also to you? The things that he just said in verse 1 through 3. So we proclaim to you that which we have seen from the beginning, that which we have heard. And, you know, so what is this letter about? It's about proclaiming Jesus, that John is an eyewitness of this. That's, that's who John is. As an apostle, that's what his job description is, to proclaim Jesus. But again, as we're going to read, you'll see there's a very specific edge or um, game plan what is it about Jesus that he's proclaiming? And that is going to be what is addressing the problem that the people are facing. Okay, so the main sentence is that he's proclaiming Jesus to them. 
what follows so that is the purpose. Why am I telling you about Jesus? It's so that you too may have fellowship with us. So I'm telling you about Jesus so that you can be a part of this, so that you can have fellowship with us. And this is a really key word. Um, I'm going to talk more about it, but but not today. Fellowship, What's a? it's a church word. How, how would you explain fellowship to somebody that's outside of the church? What do we mean when we say fellowship? So that you may have fellowship with us. We all believe in the same thing. Okay. Relationship. Okay. I'm going to give a non a non church word, and this this is it. Togetherness, that 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 we're all together. So yeah, we believe the same thing. We spend time together. We eat meals together. We play together. It's it's that feeling of we're we're on a team. In in Paul's letters, it was things like the body of Christ that we are all being built into a temple. That there is unity. So as Paul talked about it, he did use the word fellowship, but he, he, he expressed it in that unity. He said, see all the division in the world? We can't be like that. We are one in Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So that's how he stressed it. Here, John's talking about the same thing. He's talking about it slightly differently, but it's this word fellowship. The Greek word for this I mentioned because you've you've heard it it's thrown around is koinonia you, you've heard that word maybe some of you i, I see some nods i see some koinonia so it's spelled k-o-i-n so coin but with a k and then o n i a so koinonia it's it's the greek word it's translated fellowship and some churches, or you, why you've heard it is because this is, well, fel fellowship, is, it, it starts to become an overused word, and so it starts to lose its meaning and it's common, even though in church circles, it, it means a lot. Outside of that, maybe not so much. And so sometimes you use a word that is unfamiliar to teach them. We do the same thing a lot more often with love. You, you all know love, and you've heard some of the Greek words, that you know that there are multiple Greek words that all can be translated as love. And so very often the, the sermon or the teaching that you hear is on agape. Agape is one of those words in Greek that's translated as love. The reason why pastors and teachers will use that is because we want you to know that that God's love is not like our love because we know love, but we also know broken hearts and betrayal. And so we know different kind of love and God's love isn't like that. So we use that Greek word to kind of emphasize and say it's different. Um, God teaches us what, what, we, what real love is. Fellowship can, can kind of be that way. But togetherness, I think, gets at it. And for John... The key, I well, I, I don't know if I would say it's the key, but one thing that's important for us to know is God wants us to be with him, right? He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to spend eternity with him. And for the most part, Christians, I think, get that. Like, duh, pastor, that's the definition of what it is to be a Christian, to, to know God, to believe him, to want to be with him. But that's not all that's to Christianity. The second part is God also wants us to be together with fellow believers. So heaven doesn't consist of just me and God hanging out. It consists of that great multitude of all people of all times who have believed in him. And it's not just about us as individuals connecting with him. It's also about connecting and reconnecting with one another. So another way that this togetherness is emphasized so that you know that it, it means both our relationship with God, but also our relationship with others and means both of those things. They're not to be 
taken apart. Like, oh, I only need to go to church as a social function, that I need to spend time with people. No, that's wrong. Oh, well, then I only need to go to church because I need, I need God time. It's right, but it's not wrong. It's, it's both of those. I go to church because I need God time, but I also need the strength and support of my brothers and sisters in Christ, and they need what I have to give. Okay, it's both of those things. Here's another demonstration of, of how we know this is, is true. So Jesus, during his ministry, the rabbis, the Pharisees, they don't like him very much, some of them, and they're always trying to get him to say something that they can like pounce on him and say, aha, that's wrong, or that's right, but it's very unpopular, and now people aren't gonna follow you, you're not gonna have friends, you know? So he was asked, what's the most important commandment? This was a really big deal because the Pharisees and the scribes, they combed through the Old Testament and they would always like, they would have their own debates about this. Uh, of all of the commandments that God gave, like this is the most important, you know? So Jesus answered it and he didn't flinch. The most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he didn't stop the sentence. And the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus is asked, what's the most important? And he doesn't give one commandment, does he? He says, it's these two, love God, love your neighbor. Because that's what God wants of us and from us. That's the goal is not just that we're connected to him, but that we are connected to one another. And you can't love God without loving your neighbor. John would say you can't believe in Jesus without being part of this community of faith. So fellowship, John stressing fellowship. He could say, the reason I'm proclaiming to you about Jesus is because I want you to be saved. I want you to be in heaven. And I think that's true, but he's talking about that goal in this way that you would have fellowship with us. Well, who are we? We are those who believe in Jesus. We are those that we will be with him forever. We want you to be a part of that. Bob. If there is somebody that really wronged you, mm -hmm. whether it's a relative or somebody you know, mm -hmm. is that a sin? Is what a sin? That they wronged that, you? That you don't care for them? You don't want to associate with them or... You don't want to listen to them or it's, have anything to do with them. Yeah, it, 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 it is a hard thing in a, in a world of brokenness. So what is, what is wrong is if, if you harbor resentment and hate towards them, what Jesus tells us to do is pray for those who persecute us and those who hate us. We cannot hate anybody, but those, those who hate us. And if it has to be from a distance that you pray for that person and pray that you know God would change their heart and they would stop being a jerk or whatever. That's, that's how we can love them. I, I don't think it necessarily means if they're hurtful to you that you need to continue to be in their presence. So, so yeah, you can still have, have separation. What you can't do is like, uh, you know, I, I, I hate that person and I hope they spend eternity in hell yeah, kind of right. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's hard, especially in the ways that people can, can hurt us. Yeah. But again, the forgiveness that God gives to us is the forgiveness that we ought to share, not just ought to, are commanded to. And th there's that old adage, when you forgive somebody, the person that you release from prison is, is yourself. You know, that by holding on to the anger and hate, you, you think that you're like, hurting them, but you're hurting yourself. Yeah, so and so, you yeah, are. holding on to that isn't good. But the, the, the couple different instances are, you know, P Peter and Paul, they, they didn't seem to always get along very well. Uh, Paul talks about that in Galatians, that he, he opposed Peter to his face, and they, they kind of went their separate ways. And Paul, I don't know if he had a hard personality or it what, like but he, he, he had a few companions that went with him and we hear about John Mark that he spent some time with him and then he John Mark was younger it appears and he couldn't he couldn't cut it and so when he was ready to go back Paul's like I don't I don't want him to come with me and he first went out with Silas 
and then they kind of parted ways. So um, we're all sinners. None of us are perfect. And there are some personalities that just, you know, don't, don't get along. And I, I think it's okay if, if we do it in a, in a peace, peaceful and amicable way. But if you depart and there's resentment, no, we, we need to deal with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so John, he wants them to have fellowship with us, which I think is just another way of talking about our salvation. It's talking about it in a fuller way that maybe we don't often emphasize, but um, it, it does because he, he says this. It's the next thing. We want you to have fellowship with us. What does he say? Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we're connected with, with Jesus, with his Father. That's what we want you to share with us. And the brokenness of the situation is going to be if they've broken faith, so they no longer believe the same things that John taught, then their being physically together, that doesn't fix it. They need to fix the faith. They need to fix what it is that they believe. And, and so he's going to talk about that. But what if they believe the right things? But, you know, Bob, going to your point, what if the way they treat each other is just deplorable? What if they treat each other like dirt? Well, John would say, you don't have fellowship with us. That's not what we're about. And, and so you need to fix, you might say that you believe this, this but your lives don't reflect it. it. It needs to be complete in your faith and in your action. It needs to be a, a complete picture. Okay, so that's, that's this book, this letter in a nutshell. He's telling them about Jesus. We proclaim also to you, and he's doing it as an eyewitness. Why? So that you can have fellowship with us. And that fellowship isn't just to hang out together so that you can be friends. He's talking about that, that complete and full reconciliation, which is our eternal life, that, that you could have this. So then verse 4, and we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. If you read through John 14 through 17, Jesus will talk about that. He'll talk about his joy in, um, in oneness. That just as I and the Father are one, I want all of you to be one. So where did Paul in Ephesians get, about, get that theme of unity from? John 14 through 17. Here, it's that same theme, unity. The words might be a little bit different. He's talking about fellowship, but um, same picture. And in Jesus' words to the disciples, that unity creates joy. And John is saying it creates joy for us too to know that you are saved, to know that you are a part of this community, to know that even before we get to heaven, before we reach the final destination, that here on earth, we have a small glimpse of that. We have a small glimpse of that in our life together, that God has drawn us together from all different backgrounds, but we're one. We're one body. And that's why I, I like that this isn't just our church Bible study, that, that this is open to anybody that wants to come, because this is part of that joy. This is part of our fellowship. There, there are things doctrinally, we, we part our ways and we have, you know, differences and, and whatnot. And like, I get that, but we're one in Christ. And, and there's joy in that. Sometimes we're like, oh, I can't, you know, Satan is winning because of, of all of the division in the church. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. We, we, we can have our differences, but still be, be one in our fellowship and in our joy. And we do that by things like this, of just just getting together and reading and studying God's word, and we do that for joy. God, God gives us joy. This, this isn't always convenient in my schedule, but I get joy from doing it. I, I hope that you and, and your participation from it, maybe sometimes I'm talking too much or talking over your head or, you know, you did, it, that wasn't a good class or he didn't say that right. But, you know, by, by and large, just by being in his word, there's joy that, I, I that he fills us. Joy, it's just, you know, you're sort of fulfilling our need to know, uh -huh. to know yeah. better. Yeah. 
well, then maybe the heart will spill over or the head will fill, spill over uh, into the heart because, again, in, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome this world. To me, that's joy. I mean, it, it, it may not be reflected in like I'm jumping off the ceilings and, and whatnot, but it's, it's unshakable. The world's messed up. There's all sorts of bad news out there, but I, it doesn't... It might get me down from time to time, but it can't keep me down because I, I know that Jesus has overcome. And, and why I'm here is to share that joy with others so that they're down, but they, it doesn't have to be that way for them either because he has overcome and he has promised he's, he's always with us, that he hears our prayers, that he, he knows what it's like to live in this, this broken world. Um, and, and so... The, the joy that he writes about so that our joy may be complete. Okay. It, it, it will only truly be complete in, in the end. You know, yes, even in our joy now, there's sadness, but there is that time, and he wrote about it in Revelation. There will be no more tears. There will no, be no more sadness. God wipes all of that away because sin and death and Satan are put away and banished forever, and that's, that's no more a part of our life. All right, um, I got a few more minutes. Any questions, thoughts on, on that opening? So we'll, we'll then get into the, the, the meat of what's, what's the problem or what's the issue. You, like I said, you get inklings of it here. There, there seems to be some maybe misunderstanding about Jesus because these people already know about Jesus, but he's talking about this need for fellowship. So does that mean that the togetherness is, is breaking apart? Is there something getting in the way? Um, yeah, okay, well, what's, what's getting in the way? He'll start, to, he'll start to address some of those things in uh, the next section. And then the next section, this, this is, again, part of the overview. It doesn't, it doesn't have neat sections where, it, where you can hit, a, hit the pause button because instead it just it circles around and around, and he'll repeat some of these themes of fellowship, of life, of light, of darkness. He'll, he'll just kind of go round and round, and so we'll kind of tease out what's, what are some of the, the things that he's addressing as we do that, but we may stop in the middle of the thought in order to continue it from one week to the next. All right, um, other things. We have class for a few weeks now in a row. We're going to build up ahead of steam, and then there are going to be two weeks that I have off again. Um, national Youth Gathering, and then finally, like, a vacation. Um, I, I was gone last month, and it technically was vacation, but it was going to a wedding in Iowa, and there was not a lot of vacating. It was a lot of driving. Um, but the, the vacation, Bethany's family's coming, and they rented a beach house in Tampa, and so it's, it's relax time and chill out time and family, koinonia time, fellowship time with, with her family. So when is that in late That's, July it's late, August? yeah, late, late July. Um, the tw Let's look at my calendar here. I'll, I'll give you advance notice, but it'll be July 6th and 13th. Oh, that's uh, or no, 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 I'm sorry. 6th, I'll be here. The 13th and the 20th is when I will be gone. So we have two more weeks, and then I'll be gone two weeks. Yeah. All right. Um, in my haste, I forgot to pray at the beginning, I think, so I'm going to have to pray twice as long here at the end. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, this group, for those who have come, for the, the people who have been here all along, and for those that have joined along the way. And I thank you for the fellowship, the togetherness that we have around your word each week. And I pray, Lord, that as we have this time, that you would proclaim to us your word, your truth, as we study it in scriptures, that by your Holy Spirit, you would fill our hearts to overflowing that our joy would be complete, the joy that you give to us to know, Lord, that you are our Savior, that you are the one who has overcome all things, that you are the one that fills our hearts with hope and peace, that you are the one that has forgiven us and so teaches us how to forgive one another. 
We pray, Lord, for um, our world and for the the sin and brokenness uh, that we hear about and know about. And, and Lord, that's only a small picture. We know that there's so much more that goes on. But we know, Lord, that you have put your church, believers, in all different parts of this world. And we pray, Lord, that those who are in places far from us, who are believers, who share this fellowship, that they would be able to be the salt and the light that you have called us to be in our communities here, that that they would be able to change this world, to proclaim light where there is darkness and life where there is death and forgiveness where there is hate. We pray for um, Lois and for her husband, John. We pray, uh, we give thanks, Lord, that you were with him in his surgery. Uh, and we pray now in this time of rehabilitation that you would be with him, that he would be able to have a smooth recovery and be able to regain the, the motion and ability to use his uh, leg as, as he did before, and in fact, even better. We ask, Lord, that you watch over us, protect us with your uh, presence, heal those who are sick and broken, and renew us each and every day to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you so much.